gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you once again for just being who you are in our lives and, and for all that you have done on our behalf. We just give you all the, the glory and all the honor and all the praise. As we continue on with our study here in Colossians, I just ask that you, the Holy Spirit, would take and filter out all of the foolishness and all of the error, all of that which is spoken that is not truth, but just seal to our hearts only that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I hope everyone had a very blessed Christmas. We're continuing on in our study with uh, in the epistle to the Colossians, verse by verse. In our last study, I believe we're, we were somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, chapter uh, 3, uh, verse 12. Uh, I may be mistaken, but I'm going to try to do a little bit of a review here. We were looking at the uh, putting off the old man and putting on the new man, a garment change, a, a change uh, in mindset. I was asked recently what I thought that really meant, that to put off the old man and, and to put on the new man. And of course we know that, that is an idiom. And so there has to be something uh, diametrically connected to that as far as our attitude or our action is or response is concerned and uh, about the only thing that I can think that of to suggest here in that putting off the old man and putting on the new man is a different mindset a different frame of mind let me try to explain it this way when it comes to motives, I believe that uh, one Christian can do things uh, the same. Uh, let's say we have two separate Christians. One is doing the same as the other is. Uh, he's not doing the bad, and he is trying to do the good. Both Christians are doing that, but... I think what matters in a, in a great sense is motive. Why are they doing it or not doing it, and as the case may be? What prompts one to do, uh, to, to pay his taxes, uh, whereas the other would, would be doing the same thing, paying, paying their taxes, but Perhaps the motive was different. That's what I'm trying to explain. We know that we're not under law. We know that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth, Romans 10, 4. And in our looking at the putting off the old man, putting on the, the new man, uh, I think I pointed this, this out before. The common tendency is to think that that's well, now we've reverted back to law keeping as a, as a rule of life. And I don't think that we can do that with the text. We have to consider all of Scripture. So being that Christ is the end of law for righteousness to everyone that believeth, Romans 10, 4, our putting off and putting on the new man is our not looking at the, our present text is, well, we've got to stop doing all of this stuff and we've got to start doing all of this stuff. I believe it's also connected, as I said, to the first command given us in Romans chapter 6, verse 11, to reckon ourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God. And so we're looking at the old man and the new man. God simply does not work in or through the old man. He's not trying to clean up the old man, and neither are we. We know from Romans 4.15, because the law works wrath for where the, no law is, there's no transgression. And of course, there can't be any transgression where that there's no law. 
and that the law is not made for a righteous man, and that is who you are, a righteous man. Romans 7.10 says, So I discovered that the very commandment that was meant to bring life actually brought death. Christians that are living under uh, law as a principle of life, that, that attitude, that mindset toward law-keeping will never give them the life, the peace, the joy that they so often desire. In 2 Corinthians 3, 7, we read, Now if the ministry of death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at the face of Moses because of its fleeting glory. It's a ministry of death. Law is a ministry of death. Christians tend to think that law-keeping is a ministry of life, when in fact the Word itself clearly states it's a ministry of death. Galatians 3.10, All who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Over 600 uh, precepts, that's not counting the fence laws that the Pharisees set up to try to, their idea was that if they set up fence laws, it, then what they called fence laws, then they wouldn't come even any, anywhere near breaking those laws that God did give them. But we know that the law was not given to us in the first place. We know from Galatians chapter 5 that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. The text, folks, couldn't be any more clear. You, you can, we can talk about patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control all day long. But if we're looking at that, approaching that from the sense of, of law-keeping or legalism or, you know, if we do these things, then God will be pleased with us. Well, we're going... Our mind is going contrary to what the Word of God says. Against such things there is no law. I'm reminded of John chapter 6, verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent. This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent. So we see belief comes into the picture. Galatians 3, 6, Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It was because Abraham was righteous that he believed. Being filled with the fruit, according to Paul in Philippians chapter 1, verse 11, being filled with the fruit, singular, that's fruit singular in the Greek, the singular fruit of righteousness, which are by, or the, it's which is through, the original text says through, Jesus Christ unto the glory and the praise of God. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe for there's no difference. That's in Romans chapter 3. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. So, that's interesting. The text actually says that we establish the law through some principle of not being under the law. The word establish, by the way, the word is histamine, it's to make to stand. We make the law to stand. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Instead, we establish the law or we make the law to stand. Now, the first occurrence of that word, uh, histomy, establish, or make to stand, can be found in Matthew chapter 2 where we read, Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them 
the exact time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. And hearing the king, they went their way, and the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over, there, there's our word, histomy, stood over the place where the child was. So the star, God made it to stand over the Christ child. And now I'll read this again. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish, we establish the law. I found that interesting, especially given the season of the Christmas that we're in. Romans 8, 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk. How? Not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans 10, 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. I was asked about the word uh, uh, imitate or follow. Uh, someone sent me an email and they said, but Steve, aren't we told to follow Christ? Aren't we told to imitate Christ, imitate God? The word there uh, uh, for follow is the word uh, uh, mimeti. It's where we get mimic. It's it's a, it's an Im to imitate. Yes, we are to mim we we are told to. Uh, it's not it's not a bad thing to imitate God. Does that produce righteousness? No, it doesn't. You can. I invite you. To, I mean, I, and, and I in fact I encourage you to imitate God uh, to your heart's content. There's nothing in Scripture that says that God is is obligated, or that uh, there will that He we're guaranteed uh, that it's it's a guarantee that there's going to be righteousness there in our lives when we imitate God. But we are told to be in, to do that, and I believe for a very good reason. It's it's so that we'll be involved in those activities whereby the 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 possibility greater exists that will be involved in that righteousness which which comes on the basis of faith or that is produced on the basis of faith that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh that's the old man but after the spirit folks this all ties in to our present putting on and putting off Romans 13, 14, instead clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the desires of the flesh. What does it mean to clothe ourselves with Christ? It's to know that we have put on Christ, that we've died to the law so that we might bear fruit un unto God. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, Galatians, Paul says in Galatians, have put on Christ. If, we, if you have been baptized into Christ, and that's a spiritual baptism, not a water baptism, then you have put on Christ. And here in our study we're told, we're being told to put off the old man and to put on the new. I believe that there is some distinction between putting on Christ and and putting on the new man. The new man is not Christ. Christ lives in our new man. So there's some distinction there to be made, but the text is absolutely crystal clear that all of these things that we're looking at here in our present study, are they're not things that we approach from the mindset or the motive, uh, the attitude of law keeping. God is not telling us that we need to just, well, now all of a sudden we're back under law, when the law was never given to us in the first place, and now that we're to accomplish all of these things, stop doing all the bad and start doing all the good. That's what I'm trying to say. It, verse 12, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Let's just stop right there for a minute. Let's, let's at least pause long enough in our study to, to think about the fact that, that God is calling us elect, He's calling us holy. That, that word there in the Greek it means set apart for God's uh, use, God's service. And beloved, He loves us. Elect, chosen by God, we belong to Him. 
He loves us. He set us apart for service, for His use. And so put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, all of these things. Bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. The bond of perfectness. Christ's love for us is what glues us together in maturity. The word perfect, perfectness, is the word maturity. And His love for us, the text makes it clear that His love for us is what glues us together in maturity. Verse, uh, I believe, 15. They let the peace of God rule in your hearts. God has nothing against you. Oh, I wish Christians knew that. To the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Grace. And whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting that he uses the phrase, all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. If you were to do something in my name, well, I would, I would hope that you would realize that whatever you were doing in my name would be something that I, myself, would be okay with. So now I want us to look at, at this grace and motivation. I'm going to put this chart up here, this for, forgiving one another, forbearing one another, forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Colossians 3.13. I want you to look at what I've underlined in yellow. Even as we love Him because He first loved us. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Be perfect therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. The, you can't look at this without seeing that God is calling upon us to do the impossible. He's calling upon us to be like Him. To express the same love that He has for us through one another. To be perfect, to be mature. Just as your Heavenly Father is perfect, be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. That's a tough order, folks, if we're looking at this under law, but we're not. It's, we, wanna, we tend to want to look at this from the standpoint of, of grace being the motivating factor. And, uh, you know, I, so I do all this. I stop doing all this, this ugly stuff, and I start doing all this good stuff. And the motive behind that, it's, it's not a matter of law. It's not that I'm doing all this stuff so that God will be pleased with me. But if I'm doing it because I know that He is pleased with me, well, then that, that seems to make a whole lot of difference. Could it be that our motive for service is seen in our love and appreciation for who God is and all that He's done? is doing and will do in our lives rather than law. Now, I, it, I have to admit, it would appear so. Yet, personally, I've got to tell you here, I've got to stop, just sort of rein everything in here for a moment and say to you folks, I have some of a, of a problem going down that road of my doing what I do because of what God did, even as good as that might sound, and believe me, that's, that's a long way from doing, doing what I do for God because I, I think that if I do, that God's going to be pleased with me. And if I don't, He's, he's not. He's going to be angry with me. I mean, it's, we, we come light years from that to, to, to doing just be, because God has done so much for us 
But what I just want to, to lay up upon your thinking here, and I don't ask anybody to agree with me, is I have just a little bit of a problem going down that path. Because to me, even that, as good as it sounds, even that feels like I'm doing what I do for the Lord out of a sense of obligation or debt. Like, uh, well, you did all this for me, Lord, so as far as what I've done, well, you know, that's the least I can do. I think the, the real truth lies beyond the word motive. Uh, most believers I know, they, they, they at least have the common sense enough to, to look at our life and our service as being from one motive or another. Uh, based on, on some type of motive, but I'm not sure that it's, it's not, not about motive here at all, folks, but an entirely new principle of which I hope to explain at the end of this video. For now, I want to tell you what I see here in verses uh, 18 through 22. Now, you know, it's, it's easy, folks, to read these verses. Uh, wives uh, submit uh, yourselves unto your own husbands as is fit in the Lord. And, and I'm, I'm not trying to take away from the horizontal aspect of this and how our, our, our lives are to reach out toward one another and we respond to one another on, a, on the physical plane here. I don't want to detract from that whatsoever. I believe we are to absolutely uh, consider the physical aspect of wives submitting themselves under their husbands as is fit in the Lord. But I also believe, folks, that we're looking at something vertical here. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, okay, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. We, we looked at that when we were studying through the epistle to the Ephesians. There's a vertical aspect is, is what I'm trying to say here to this. I'm not sure that first it, in, I'm not sure, but that first and foremost, God is is wanting us to look at at least and not and not ignore the, the vertical aspect of all of this. Uh, when we come when it comes to verse 19, husbands love your wives and be not bitter against them. Well, again, uh, to be bitter against our wife. Uh, for husbands to be bitter against their wives when God has nothing against us. Are, are you starting to, to see what I'm talking about here? To the praise of the glory of His grace wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Again in, in Ephesians. Same when it comes to the children. Children, obey your parents in all things for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. And if we just limit our thinking or limit the, the, the text there to, to just, you know, uh, phys, um, physical children, uh, children, you know, as far as, as age is concerned, our kids, and I think we're missing the fact that as obedient children ourselves, not fashion, fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, First Peter 1, uh, 14. Uh, we are also children. So uh, we're to listen to God. Children, obey your parents in all things. We are to listen to God. Understand what God has is saying to us because that is well-pleasing to the Lord. Uh, fathers, provoke not your children to anger uh, lest they be discouraged and once again we have the vertical we can see or sense the vertical aspect of that uh, therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ we read that in 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 Romans we we looked at that we took a good look at that when we were studying through Romans so the same with servants obey in all things your masters, according to the flesh, not with eye service, 
as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. So when we look at the at that, we can strictly limit our understanding or our thinking to that which is horizontal, or we can also look at at that from the vertical standpoint. You know, am I am I now seeking the approval of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still try, uh, trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. So, from let there be light to, to him uh, calming the raging sea, I want, you to, I want you to think about how powerful, just how powerful his word is in our lives. Uh, he called into existence everything that, that was. He created everything uh, just by speaking it into existence. From let there be light to, to him calming the raging sea, peace be still. Uh, raising Lazarus from the dead, Lazarus come forth. Just, just the spoken word. And a great number of other things by the word of his mouth. And we, and I remind you that the word here that we have, that we so are, are so privileged to hold in our hand is, is the word of God. It's not just uh, uh, printed words on paper. It's the very word of God himself. It's not Paul's logic. It's not, it's not uh, a group of individuals who came together and through uh, human logic and human reasoning composed or drafted you know, these, these chapters and these verses and uh, recording their experiences and so on and so forth, uh, simply with, apart from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Folks, this is God's Word. And we know that it is... Uh, this we are we are privileged to partake of of his word. His word literally changes our lives. I've spent some time talking to other believers about just how precious and and how exciting it is to me to talk about how that his word alone changes our lives. We don't conform to our lives to the Word. That's law. The Word itself transforms our lives, and that's grace. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust, 2 Peter 1.4. The embodiment of the law, the fulfillment of the law. The one who fulfilled it perfectly and now lives inside of us speaks, and he does so through this word, his word. He speaks, and it's done. Not by law. Nor is the motive, I believe, one of love, and that's, that's where many of you, I'm, I believe, will probably disagree with me. I base that conclusion on years of, of Bible study and in, in looking at love as being as great as love is, folks. And we know it is. The greatest of these is love. As great as it is, because our love, our love, can fail. We know that His won't, but ours often does. Our faith can fail us as well. Love is also a characteristic, a singular, a single characteristic, grouped among many other characteristics, of the singular fruit of the Spirit, not fruits of the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit. I am absolutely persuaded that it, when we talk about the fruit, the singular fruit of the Spirit, if one characteristic is missing, none are there in our lives. 
And if just one is there, they're all there. Why? Because it is the singular fruit of the Spirit. It's what the Spirit Himself bears. And so, given the fact that it's also a characteristic of the singular fruit of the Spirit, I wouldn't even think of our part in the sense of motive uh, at all. Not really. And I know that kind of takes me off. It, at least it appears to sound as if I've if I've if I've departed from the love motive, then well, I can I can hear you saying to me now, well, Steve, where do you go from there? It's not law. It's not love. What is it? I believe it's life. It's not law. It's not love, but the life principle. And I wouldn't even call it a motive. I'd call it a principle. The principle of life. The life of Christ in us. The spirit of the life of Christ in us. It's the life principle. It's because we've been made alive. It's because His Word transforms our lives. I came to give you life, He said, and life more abundantly. We're looking at the... If, if we... Look, folks, I don't know how to explain this except to say, if we look at this, all of this, from the perspective that, that God does something because we do something, then we have put the cart before the horse. We do love Him because He first loved us. I'd never argue that fact. I believe that's true. But even our doing because God has done can be viewed from the sense of obligation or debt. As far as I'm concerned, and I don't ask anybody to agree with me, it is not law or love that prompts us to live a godly life. I believe that there's another principle at work, and that is it's the life principle. Not law or love, but life. The crown that I cast at His feet will not be tainted by any residue of human motive, no matter how seemingly noble or honorable. Because even if I were to view my own appreciation for what He has done in my life as the primary motive, just by that much, I believe that I would be reserving some glory and honor for myself. I cannot imagine me saying to Jesus, Well, Lord, unto you be all the honor and glory, but I did my part too, so you giving me this crown, well, I figure that's the least I could do. Or that's the least that you could do. You know, I, I so appreciated all that you did for me, Lord, all that you did on my behalf, all these abundant blessings, all this love and the mercy and the grace that you've shown me in my life. I really do appreciate that, Lord. So whatever I did, well, that's the least that I could do. I just don't think that's going to be the case. So I know this is a short video, but it does help move us along in the uh, third chapter of Colossians. We're coming near to the end of Colossians. I was asked if, to give some thought to, uh, after Colossians, to go into the Gospel of John, teaching verse by verse. And uh, I've decided that that's probably a pretty good idea. So you may look, uh, some of you, just letting you know ahead of time. Those of you who are excited about that, you can look forward to that. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Once again, I hope you all had a, a very happy Christmas. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.